Uh, hello, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So today's a special episode of Philosophy for Living on Earth, which is brought to you live by the Ayn Rand Institute, and in which we discuss big questions of life from the perspective of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. Now, unfortunately today, so it's Saturday, March 21st, life on Earth seems to be grinding to a halt. Uh, and today we're gonna ask to talk about one crucial aspect of the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact on the financial markets and the economy. Now keep in mind that nothing said today is meant as investment advice. What we're talking about is sort of, you can think of it as financial and economic analysis and commentary that's informed by the philosophy of objectivism. Uh, as usual, you can post questions in Zoom or if you're watching on a social me media platform like Facebook in the in the comments section, you can post questions. I can't guarantee that we're going to get. Uh, oh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So my fault. Oh, OK. <laughs> I was wondering. Um, I thought I had screwed something up. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I can't guarantee we'll get to a lot of questions because there's a lot to talk about. And as you can see, I'm joined by uh, two guests that I'm going to be interviewing. And let me actually stop sharing the screen so you can actually see them. Um, and these two guests, they're actually, I was just thinking about it, they're actually both former bosses of mine, um, <laughs> but former, so I don't have to give softball questions. <laughs> uh, so one, I'm joined by Yaron Brook, who's the current chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute and its past executive director. He's also a former professor of finance and still an active money manager. And second, we've got Rob Tarr, who he has a master's degree in philosophy and he's been involved in the investment world for 20 plus years, including as a portfolio manager and research group manager. Um, so it will be very interesting to get both of their perspective. Now, Yaron, you wanted to say a couple of words at the outset before we plunge into the discussion? Yeah, let me just say uh, a few things. One is I want to reiterate what Ankar said. Um, nothing I or Rob, I think he'll, he's is safe to say, nothing we say should be construed as investment advice. Um, we're not going to be making specific investment recommendations. And if something sounds like it is, it is not. <laughs> don't. Uh, attribute to us any kind of investment suggestions. Um, it's really, really important these days to make those kind of qualifications. Um, second, I, I want to emphasize something that I think we'll probably talk about as we're going along because I think it'll keep coming back. Um, economics is hard. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it, it, you know, the, particularly hard in a mixed economy and trying to predict what is going on and what is going to happen. That is, predictions about the future are hard in any field. But in economics in particular, because there's so many moving parts, so many thinking minds, so many different actors, so many things happening, it is very, very difficult to make estimations about what's going on actually right now, never mind about what we expect to happen. Now, we're going to do that, but, but and we might even disagree on some of the stuff. And part of that disagreement might be because we're estimating things a little differently. But it's... Um, even if you have the theory right, the application of that theory is super complex. And again, I think Rob would agree with me on this. And then I just want to, because most of you know who I am, I want to say something about Rob. I, I mean, more than what Anka just said. I mean, Rob, uh, I've been talking about these kind of issues with Rob for 20 years. And for a while there, Rob was my boss, <laughs> in, in a way, right? And, and um, Rob, I think, is, is, is probably the most knowledgeable or, or certainly one of the most knowledgeable people about Austrian economics and the application of Austrian economics to real life that I know. So it's not just, not that it should be a just, that he's uh, an investor and, and has a lot of experience in investing, but Rob is self-taught in economics, self-taught in Austrian economics, and, and really profound uh, think, and you can see that in his essay uh, on, on economic value that I recommend to everybody um, that was published. And I don't remember what, what, what the name of the journal is, but it was published recently. And is it available online? Uh, I don't think so. No, no. Well, one of these days I've talked to Greg about we need to get that essay online because I think it's an important essay. So that's all I wanted to say. And I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Anka. 
And actually, if I can just add to what you were saying, Ron, about uh, theory and practice. Um, yeah, you can get the theory down straight. And, you know, a common assumption in economics is ceteris paribus. So everything else held constant. Yes. But the problem is, which causal factors are actually in operation at any given time? How do they overlap and intersect and so on? I mean, that's a real difficulty to actually, you know, understand and predict what's going on in any particular case. Yep. Um, okay, so with that, let's plunge in. So the first question I wanna ask, and I'll say a little bit on why I'm asking this. So people have seen, I assume the stock market plunging, they've seen other uh, economic disruptions, certainly unemployment claims in the US are starting to go up. Um, and they're talking about stimulus, some have been passed. So, so people have seen, but I'm sure there's a lot of stuff they haven't seen. And like you guys as uh, active in the field and in the markets that are seeing things. So I want to get part of that perspective, but I want to get how you were thinking about the markets prior to this. Uh, to, I mean, so in, we were in the US at record highs in 2020, um, just before this pandemic is really hitting uh, and disrupting everything. And were you thinking of it as the, the market is sort of ripe for some kind of thing that's gonna cause a fall or not? Uh, and, and the reason I'm asking this is how much does it condition the way you're looking at the present of what is happening? That it was like, it was getting too high. So there was gonna be some kind of event that's gonna, and then the, the steepness of the fall how, so I want to get from both of your perspectives, sort of how you you more a little more widely how you were looking at the markets prior to this uh, event. Uh, whoever wants who wants to go first. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I was definitely in the camp that we were ripe for a fall. Um, you know, I think distortions over the last ten years, where we've had near zero interest rates for most of the last ten years, have caused an incredible amount of distortions. Um, you know, going back to the 2000s, in 2003, the Fed reduced the interest rate to 1%, mm -hmm. uh, which at the time was an absurdly low interest rate. Um, that sparked the housing bubble because people could borrow cheaply short term and, you know, get cheap mortgages, adjustable rate mortgages. Corporations could borrow cheaply short term and so on. So that caused all kinds of distortions in the housing bubble era, which had to eventually get washed out, which they were. Um, but then the response was the Fed lowered interest rates to zero, which uh, is completely absurd. Um, fortunately, we have not gone negative interest rates, which is even beyond absurd, which Japan and Europe have done. Um, so we had zero interest rates from 2008 until 2015. Um, and uh, I think, you know, initially things were slow, but in the last few years, there's been just a tremendous amount of debt piled up by corporations. I think corporations are at the most levered uh, level ever. Um, the stock market has really taken off. Um, and, and I think unmoored from the fundamentals. So last year, S&P 500, the earnings were actually down for the S&P 500 stocks. The stock market was up 30%. Um, and we're starting to see some signs of late stage bubbles, like all of a sudden Tesla goes from $200 to $900 for no reason. Uh, all of a sudden SpaceX goes from $10 to $40 a share for no reason. Um, so I think we are definitely rate for fall. I've, for a couple of years, I've been saying and thinking that I think uh, the coming crash would be worse than 2008. Um, so I was expecting definitely that there would be some big uh, unraveling. Uh, I didn't know the timing. It's always hard to predict the timing of those things. Now, the coronavirus came along, and I think that greatly exacerbated it. So, yeah, that is a huge one-off uh, negative thing. Um, but I think it would have been a lot less bad if the markets hadn't been so overvalued. So, you know, I basically agree with all of that. I, you know, I, I, my challenge has always been, you know, when, right? We, yep. we all know that there are these distortions and perversions. And, and I think the key here really is the Fed. That is, I, I, the stock market in many respects is responding to what the Fed is doing. And if you've got interest rates at zero or the equivalent of zero and you're discounting future present, you know, discounting future cash flow, future earnings, you get very big numbers if your interest rate is very little. So the interest rates really distort and pervert economic decision making on a, on a grand scale. It makes, um, it makes projects that would seem uh, unprofitable in, in a normal environment suddenly profitable. And you get investments that shouldn't be made. Um, and, and, and 
investment that should be made are not made. So you, you get a complete distortion of where the money actually flows and how that translates into stock prices to me has always been, you know, I could always sense, yeah, it seems a little high, but I'm usually early, you know, as I think Rob was there when I was buying put options on Amazon in 1999 and a year too early. And, and I'll uh, just say a word about what put options are. I'm not sure. Put options knows. are basically a bet uh, on, and a relatively cheap way to bet, if you will, on uh, prices going down, on, on the price of a stock going down. So you get paid if the stock goes down, you lose your, pri your initial investment if the stock stays flat or goes up. Uh, so you're capped on how much you can lose, but you can make a lot of money on the other side. And, and uh, I did it a year too early, which is, I've got a long history of doing that. So timing, of course, in investing is important, but yes, what the Fed has been doing, and it's, it's, and it's not just that they've kept interest rates low at the low end, but what quantitative easing did, if you remember QE1, 2, and 3, where the, where the Fed was buying mortgage-backed securities, it was buying government bonds. Mm -hmm. It was also then lowering interest rates on the long end. So it was artificially lowering interest rates, not just on the short end, which is bad enough, but also on the long end. So think about Different bonds have different maturities. Different bonds pay off over different time frames, And typically when we talk about interest rates, or the Fed does, it talks about interest rates, uh, uh, you know, overnight interest rates or very short-term interest rates. But actually that interest rate is going to be different than a 10-year or 30-year mm -hmm. payoff. But the, the, the Fed for the first time really on a scale was manipulating long-term rates, not just short-term rates over the last 10 years. And that has, again, profound Im impacts on the way people invest, on, on the way people think about risk. It, 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 n dumb, it, um, not dumbs, what's the, what's the term? It, uh, it dulls people's sensitivity to risk. And what, what we saw before 2008, what we saw here is, is, is people weren't uh, demanding a higher return for higher risk or not as much as seems rational. Mm -hmm. So the whole, the whole investment world was distorted. And you also see, you, and, and you saw different industries going different directions and uh, or some stocks were very, very cheap. Other stocks were, I thought, pretty cheap relative to what was going on. But it's so hard to make long-term decisions because yes, something is gonna trigger it. And the thing about the coronavirus that triggers is it, it's, not like, it's not like housing triggered 08 where you knew where the crisis was gonna be. It was you know, and, and then it would have spillover effects. Here, the trigger, and we'll talk about this some more, is basically the entire economy. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not in the malinvested section. It's everywhere is, is collapsing. And then how do you estimate what's going to hurt more? And what it's, it's, it's much more complicated, I think, because uh -huh. they're shutting down production. Yeah, yeah. so let's talk about... Uh, oh. I, I was just going to say the... well. You know, I think one thing to say is that for the housing bubble, yes, the malinvestment was concentrated in the housing sector. Um, I think there's a good argument in the late, the latest episode, it's, it has been the whole economy. So, I mean, I know what you're saying, the coronavirus has shut down the whole economy, but, you know, I think the malinvestment has been the whole economy. So some people are calling it the everything bubble. Um, you know, stocks are at record valuations, bonds are at record valuations, real estate's at record valuations, and so on. So, um, so I think there's a sense in which the whole economy was ripe for for a fall. Um, so if, if we separate out, but if it's possible to separate out the coronavirus, so it, it's hitting the news December, th there's already government action, at least in China, blocking down cities and so on. But the disruption that, oh, we might have this novel virus that's deadly and, I mean, fairly deadly and contagious. And, so, and that is like that's a disruption to things and to life, to some extent at least. And what was, how is the market reacting to that? But then you get massive government reaction to it, locking down our cities. Uh, when it gets to Italy, it's first, it seems like they're not doing much, but then they're locking down whole regions. And then you get um, central bank action in regard to it from the Fed, but not just, I think, as you said earlier, Rob, not just the Fed. So in terms of how the market was reaction to there's this new novel virus that might be a threat and then to all the government action in response to that, if you can at all separate those. 
Yeah. And actually, let me throw a third thing on the pile too, is just the crash in oil prices. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have that on the list. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there's three big things we're dealing with. Um, so there's you know, just the general overvaluation that was ripe for a fall, the coronavirus, and then the oil collapse, um, which is Saudi Arabia and Russia basically letting loose and saying, we're going to let prices fall. Uh, it, you know, I think a big part of the motivation is to clear out the shale oil producers. There's been a bane in their, in their this, the thorn in their side. Um, but you know, that's been a big part of the US economy over the last 10 years, one of the biggest sources of employment growth. Um, so we're dealing with that collapsing now on top of everything else. Um, and then as you say, Ankar, so then, so we've got three big economic issues, any one of which by themselves would have been a big deal. Um, you know, the oil one, the least of all, but it was still would have been you know, a big hurt to the economy. Um, and then we have to deal with the response. So we've got, you know, what are the policymakers likely to do, both the Fed in terms of monetary and liquidity stimulus? What are the, uh, what's Congress likely to do? And then we have to think based on what they are likely to do and might do, what are the likely effects of that, of their, the things they do? And then the third thing is, well, long-term, you know, what are the long-term effects? So, you know, the so-called unintended consequences or the, you know, what's the, what's the hangover from all the stuff that they end up doing now? So how to think about that is like, is a, it's definitely a multidimensional <laughs> chessboard. <laughs> If I can use that word, um, trying to figure all that stuff out. So um, yeah, it's, I think that's why a lot of market participants are just completely at a loss. So you hear everybody saying, from you know the top names of the top hedge fund guys saying they're just they have absolutely no idea what's going on or how to play it. So, so you know, so, so part of what you were asking is how did the markets react early and how they so the S and P peaked in February when this was all known, and I think that two reasons for that. Uh, one is one of the things that the mixed economy does is again, it dulls the mind in terms of long-term thinking and estimating real risk. And it, I can't imagine in a free market, people would have looked at what was going on in China and said, eh, we're going to go to all-time highs in the stock market and we're going to continue buying as if nothing's going on because that's what they did. So even if even if you assume the government's not going to respond at all and every, our government is going to be as rational as imaginable, even then you have to assume some economic slowdown just because people are sick and they're staying home and stuff. Mm -hmm. So and, and then you saw what the Chinese did and what hit it took their own economy. Uh, by then, by the time the S&P was hitting all-time highs, the Chinese economy was already projected to be in a massive recession. So everybody knew that this, so you have to wonder what was, you know, what, why people were ignoring this. And again, I think this has to do with the certain dulling of risk because the government will take care of it. Uh, the Fed will solve it. Things will happen. And then starting in, I think it's around February 22nd, the market start declining uh, and, and the market kind of the realization of what's happening starts hitting partially because of what's happening in, in Europe, partially what's happening in, in China. But also then it becomes clear that our government is now, you know, starting to really shut things down. And, and the real panic, I think, has set in in the last two weeks. And, and it reminded me of 2008 because I've always thought that the market in 2008, the market really took a hit when investors came to the conclusion that the people they were counting on, Bernanke and Paulson, had no idea what they were doing, were completely clueless. And that happened around Lehman, right? It wasn't the Lehman bankruptcy. It was the complete randomness of the Lehman bankruptcy. The fact that they were not bailed out and, and the next 24 hours later, somebody else was, right? Uh, uh, the insurance company that names slipped away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and then the fact that Paulson goes to Congress and says, give me $700 billion and let me do whatever the hell I want with it because I, you know, I don't have a plan. And if you don't, by the way, it's the end of the world, he tells, he tells the audience. So whether you think banks should have been bailed out or not, the way it was done was full of hysteria and panic on behalf of the politicians, on the side of the politicians. And I think that's when the market basically decided, maybe it is the end of the world. And it, you know, the people who supposedly know have no clue what is going on. They don't know what to do. And everything collapsed at that point in a much more dramatic fashion than had previously. So I think, I think it's that. And I think the same thing has been felt the last two weeks. My sense of the market has been, and talking to investors and people like that is, we don't know what these people are going to do. I mean, every day the Fed comes out with a new program. Um, we don't know what this is going to be in this stimulus package. We can't price it. We can't quite 
figure out what, how to do with it. And then what does it mean that everybody has to stay at home? Wait a minute. That means nobody goes to work. Mm-hmm. Well, what's the implication of nobody going to work mm-hmm. on the economy? I mean, you can't, even, you can't even really conceptualize that. What does that actually mean? It means no production. That's yeah. zero GDP, not zero GDP growth, but just no, no economic activity. That is unthinkable. And I, I think most of us have a really hard time dealing with uncertainty anyway, or dealing with risk anyway. Now you've taken it to another dimension by basically shutting everything down. How do we even think about that? How do you conceptualize that? And I think most people just gave up. And, and you saw in the last two weeks and accelerating into the end of this week, kind of people just, just saying, you know, we, we don't know what the hell is going on, so we better be in cash. Yeah. Because, because cash, we know approximately what it's worth. We have no clue what this other stuff is worth. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a sense of sell everything, liquidate everything. So just indiscriminate selling across every market. So not just stocks. There were massive dislocations in credit markets, massive dislocations in the treasury bond market, which is supposed to be the safest and most liquid bond market. Uh, massive dislocations in the currency market, which is by far the largest dollar volume of trade. It's like four trillion of trading every day. Um, you know that was, you know, effectively shutting down, and you're seeing huge moves. Like uh, one day, Norwegian krone fell 13% in a single day. Um, so yeah, so I think it was just this attitude of de-risk, deleverage, sell everything indiscriminately, get out because we just, you know, who the hell knows what's going on. And people are going to dollars. People people view the dollar yeah. as a safe haven and the dollar is going through the roof against all yeah. the economic um, I'm surprised gold isn't doing better, but but uh, but I think people are also pricing in the idea of of uh, of uh, what people call deflation, of uh, rather than of in a sense the purchasing power increasing, not for the right reasons maybe, but increasing. Um, so it's hard to tell exactly what's going on there. But also, oh, I did want to say something about oil. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit less, it's a little bit less obvious to me, the impact of, of what's going on with oil. And again, I think it's more uncertainty than anything else. Because the fact is that cheap oil is, is good <laughs> for almost every other activity except fracking and the people who support fracking. Now, yes, a, a chunk of the US economy, particularly in Texas, is dedicated to fracking. But China, for example, as it's rumping, ramping up production back up, uh, now that they've loosened up the restrictions, uh, is benefiting enormously from cheap, very cheap oil. Uh, they have cheap energy. They can now ramp up production at much lower cost of production, which I think helps them. I think it helps us when we go back to work. If we go back to work, energy costs will be lower, which is, which is for the most of the U.S. economy, a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, so I do think oil is a mixed bag, it's short-term consequences on the oil patch, but it's long-term consequences on the general economy are pretty good if it stays this low. And, but again, who knows as Saudi Arabia, I mean, the whole goal here, the reason Saudi Arabia is, one of the reasons it's keeping low prices is to destroy fracking and to basically gain a monopoly or, or gain greater market share. As it does that, it's not gonna keep prices low. It's- How much of an issue for the oil do you think that it's, and it, the disruptiveness is that these are political decisions. So in a, even a semi-free industry, it's you don't have a whole country saying, okay, we're changing how much oil we're gonna produce. So, mm-hmm. so how much of it, like, it adds to the political uncertainty of what are they, and are they gonna cut, they're gonna change it dramatically in one month from now. So how much do you think the politi- it adds to the political uncertainty? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think it, 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 it does because what a, what, a, what politically, what are people going to do? Uh, politically, I mean, just think about the idea of bailouts. I mean, are, are people going to bail out the, the fracking business? And what is that going to entail? Um, it, it adds uncertainty to how people are going to behave and, and what people are going to do. So it's, it's um, and then what, it, what is Russia going to do? I mean, this is the thing that, that even more sensitive than our fracking industry, the fact is that Russia... The, the cost to produce oil in Russia is high. The, the reason Saudi Arabia can do this, I can't remember the exact number, but it costs something like 38 cents a barrel to get oil out of the ground in Saudi Arabia. And they can sell it for, right now it's a 21, 22, something like that. So their profit margin is pretty healthy. Now, 
it's the only industry in Saudi Arabia. So they subsidize everything else using this. So it's very questionable how long they can keep doing this. They, they probably can't. But Russia has a very high cost of production. They're in the, you know, in the North Sea and in Siberia, and it's very expensive to produce oil. They cannot survive under this. What happens if the Russian economy collapses? What tr trickle effect does that have on Europe, which relies on natural gas from Russia? And all kinds of things that you start imagining. And, and I think part of your point, Anka, is if Saudi Arabia had 20 companies, and yeah. then nobody would be coordinating this. Like yeah. One company would increase one. Yeah. yeah, you know, the fact that it's centralized, the fact that it's nationalized mm -hmm. makes it so much worse, which, you know, I don't know if it's it's a topic we're going to discuss, but that's, it's part of the health, it's why our healthcare system and why Italy's healthcare system and all these healthcare systems are struggling so much is because they have the same structure. It's centralized. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the political risk is very real. You know, it could, tomorrow, Saudi Arabia and Russia could reach an agreement and say, hey, actually, we've come to an agreement to raise oil prices to $40, $50 a barrel, or they may not. You know, there's been Russia, I think a lot of times they're talking big, but Russia says we can last 10 years with oil prices at this level uh, because of their sovereign wealth fund and so on and so forth. Saudi Arabia, as Ron says, they have very low cost of production, but somebody calculated that they need $84 a barrel in order for their budget to be balanced, in order to generate enough state going. Yeah, exactly. That's the welfare state. Yeah. yeah. So how long can they last with low oil prices? Um, you know, their motive in large part is to clear out the shale frackers. Because one thing that's happened is that oil used to be very inelastic, um, mm -hmm. meaning that if you raised the price, if you restricted supply and raised the price, oil producers would still make more money, even though they're selling less. Um, but what the shale frackers have done is they've flattened out. They made it very elastic. So as soon as oil goes up a little bit, they can flood the market with oil. As soon as oil goes down a little bit, you know, they cut off production substantially. Um, so that has kind of stymied OPEC and Russia who, you know, they want to collude in order to cut supply and raise the price. So that's been the thorn in their side. So they want to clear those guys out has been the basic motive. But, you know, how long will they keep prices low? Will they announce something new tomorrow? That's like you said, that's just right. part of why markets are unable to deal with this. So I, I want to add one more, one point to the point we made earlier about the stock market being uh, too high or, or whatever. Somebody reminded me in the super chat of a, um, part of the, part of my struggles with getting with it, where it's overvalued, undervalued and so on, or where, where's the, is the fact that while all the distortions are there, I do think, you know, um, production is happening. We're getting products that enhance human life. Standard of living, I think generally has increased over the last 10 years. How much of that is actually reflected in profit and valuations? How much is the profit and valuations bubble uh, driven by interest rates? How much? And that's what, and you see, that's what government intervention in the economy does. It makes it impossible to separate, to figure out what's real and what's not, mm -hmm. what's, what's true investment, what's true life enhancing production and what's bubble and wouldn't exist otherwise. And I've always had a hard time because I, I tend naturally to focus on all the good stuff, which is, oh, look at my iPhone, it's even better now. <laughs> and it, so Apple should be worth more or whatever, right? It, it, that's pretty superficial, but you know, that kind of attitude. And, but at the same time, recognizing that no, some of this is clearly driven by government action and Fed action and low interest rates and, art, and, and artificiality that is created and, and lack of competition and a bunch of other things that the mixed economy produces. Yeah, I mean, one thing of artificiality is just because interest, rates, because interest rates have been so low, corporations have been able to leverage up to an unprecedented extent. So corporate debt uh, is at all time highs. Um, and they've been using a lot of that debt to do share buybacks, which, you know, in general, share buybacks are not a bad thing. But if they're doing them because they're able to issue a lot of debt, because interest rates are low, and then they have a lot of money to do share buybacks, which elevates the stock market. You know, one of the biggest sources of new money into the stock market has been corporate share buybacks. So, you know, how much of the elevated uh, stock market level is just due to that? You know, I think probably a, a, a substantial amount. And those are going away now. So, I mean, corporations are not going to be able to do buybacks anymore. Right. Um, so, and you know, another uh, factor of low interest rates is that does jack up corporate earnings. You know, if companies ten years ago had to issue bonds at 8% and now they can issue them at 4%, well, you know, that goes right to the bottom line. So if interest rates normalized and credit spreads normalized, all of a sudden the earnings are gonna take a hit. Yep. Um, so there've been questions about, uh, I mean, people are posting questions about what does this remind you of? So I think you've both talked about 2008 
Um, but so both the crash, but the government and Fed or central bankers response to that. Going back through, may say, may say, say the tw history of the 20th century, uh, does it remind you of other episodes? And particularly, I, and you might not know about this, but so like during the Spanish flu pandemic, what, how did markets react to that? How did governments react to that? And it, was, it, was it quite different than what is going on now or, or are there similarities? Well, if I think, you know, just my, my, I'm not an expert on that period, but I think back in 1918, in, in 1918 1919, there was nothing special going on. We actually hit a recession, I think in 1920. Um, and, and that's a recession where famously the government did nothing and we came out of it really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there was any real market response in 18 and 19 that I can tell. Now, nothing dramatic enough to make the history books in a sense uh, that, 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 that I've read about uh, in the United States, even though a lot of people died. I mean, a lot of people died in the, in the in worldwide and the tens of millions of people died from the Spanish flu. And I'm sure it had some economic consequences, but it wasn't you know, so concentrated and the economy didn't shut down. So the economy must have taken some hit, but not enough to, to generate a major economic downturn. Yeah, and I, I think 1918 is kind of hard, 1920 is kind of hard just because I think things are so different now. So the stock market was a much tinier part of the economy back then. Um, you know, very few companies would go public at that time. Um, and then also we were just coming out of World War One, So, you know, a lot of the economy is geared towards war production and then that was going to be shifted to non-wartime production and so on. So, so it's hard to say exactly um, you know, what the parallels would be. Um, you know, I do, in some sense, I think it's like 2008 because I thought the unraveling of ultra low interest rates would cause some kind of crash and a quick unraveling. Um, and markets became very fragile too. Another aspect is just there was a lot of illiquidity in the markets which made them more fragile and ripe to a crash. Um, but, you know, the one thing, you know, the, the issue of the economy shutting down because of quarantines or because of social distancing and so on, that I can't really think of any parallels. Um, and that, that's the new thing that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. And, you know, I've, I've got to think it's going to be really bad. Um, I think people are just trying to figure that out right now. Okay, so let's, let's talk about that in, in a minute. But let's talk just a little bit about on the more monetary policy in this issue, both explain the issue of illiquidity but also the Fed response and how much do you read it? So the Fed cut rates and cut it dramatically on a Sunday, mm -hmm. which many people interpret it as, as it's pan, we have to do it even before the markets open. So, yeah. so interpret it as the Fed's panicking about this. How much do, do you view it as this was um, an economic decision versus a political? Because they also had pressure from President Trump to do something and he was even talking about removing the Fed. They're supposed to be independent, but removing that. So how much did you, do you view it as this was essentially, this was, they're worried about the liquidity and so on, they have to do this, or it's a lot political that they're, they're doing it to appease the politicians? Um, I, I, would, I would bet it wasn't that political. Like I think uh, the Fed was due to meet on Wednesday anyways. Um, and it was widely expected they would cut by 1% on Wednesday. So in effect, they just uh, advanced it by three or four days. I mean, it is unprecedented to do an uh, emergency cuts on a Sunday. So I think there's only been something like three past occasions where they've done an emergency cut between, meeting, between meetings like that. Um, but they were going to do it on Wednesday anyways. Um, you know, the market, you, you, could, you can see implied in the market what the Fed's going to do. And generally, the Fed validates whatever the market's expecting. So for a couple of weeks now, the market's been saying the Fed's going to cut by you know, 75 basis points or a you know, full percentage point. Um, so I think that was probably baked in the cake already. But the market, the market could have anticipated political the political pressure, which True. was happening yeah. all the time. So it's hard to tell from that. But I agree. I think I think the Fed would have done it anyway. <clears throat> I think that's what the Fed does. What is it? It yeah. doesn't know how to do anything other than, right. in the face of potential recession, cut rates. That's that's kind of baked into everything that they do. Um, but notice well, that they cut interest rates one time before, two weeks ago. They cut interest yeah. rates, and they did it in the middle of the week, normal time. And the markets just collapsed as soon as the announcement was happening, particularly bank stocks just plummeted. And I think what they thought was, we'll do it on a Sunday. People will have time to think about it and see that it's the right thing to do. And we'll get a positive response from the markets. Of course, all that happened was instead of collapsing the day of the announcement, the market 
was was down the next day. Yeah. But nothing nothing really changed in terms of reaction. But I think the reason for the Sunday was just hope that the markets would treat it with more calm. And yeah. and I think instead the markets read it, even though they were expecting it, they read it as, yeah, it's as bad as we think it is. It's as bad as we thought it was, and it's it's really 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 bad. So uh, the Fed is is. Uh, yeah, I mean, immediately after the announcement, markets opened about an hour later. The overnight electronic markets, and they were limit down. Exactly. Much immediately, so, and yeah. then limit, yeah. and then they opened in Monday morning, and they were limit down, and they shut yeah. down for fifteen minutes. And so it was, it was, it was the worst day I think since. Um, I can't, I can't remember. Since, Eighty-seven. Yeah. Since. So yeah, Monday was down twelve percent. That's the third worst day ever. Uh, second worst day in the last eighty years. And yep. uh, 29. Yeah. Yeah. And so 1987 um, will never be beaten because now they shut down the market if it's down 20% or more. So that, that record will stand forever until they change the rules. So. I remember that day in 87. That was yeah. quite, quite something. Um, but the Fed is doing a lot more than just cutting interest rates, a lot more. Yeah. And the interesting thing to me about the Fed, and I remember actually commenting on this and not knowing what the answer was, but months ago, the Fed started intervening into the repo markets, into the repurchase markets. And repurchase markets are these very short-term markets where people, where companies, not individuals, but companies, and um, basically put up treasuries as collateral. This goes to the liquidity issue that Rob was talking about. Put up, they have to say, so let's say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a corporation and I've got a bunch of treasuries, I've got a bunch of bonds in my, in my portfolio, in, in my vault or whatever, right? And but I need cash. I, I don't want the treasuries, I need cash. So what I can do is I can go into the market, it's called the repo market, and I can lend my treasury to another party and they give me the cash. And then I can use that cash to pay taxes, to pay payroll, to pay suppliers, to do whatever things I need for the cash. And I remember in the fall, there was this day, so the interest rates in this market are very, very low because you've got collateral, which is a government bond, and usually get paid back less than two weeks. It could be a day, it could be overnight, it could be a week, it could be two weeks. So it's a very short-term loan, mm -hmm. highly collateralized. And yet on a day, I, I can't remember the month, but, but in the fall, interest rates went to 10%. Mm -hmm. And the Fed immediately intervened with like $50 billion and started pouring money, started participating. So basically it was the one accepting the treasury and giving out the money, right? And lending out the money. And right now, by the way, it's doing it at the tune of $1.5 trillion, right? It's basic supply and liquidity of $1.5 trillion. Now, this isn't just money going into the economy because they get it back. But if they keep doing this, it is $1.5 new trillion in the economy. Now, so this is in the fall. And I remember saying to people in the fall, this has to be a signal that something is crazy in the market. And my speculation at the time was that certain banks were trying to borrow in the overnight market and other banks didn't want to give the money because they were afraid they would default. And I think the primary bank at the time that was suspect was Deutsche Bank, uh, European banks are a disaster, have been a disaster really since 2008, but certainly since the Greek financial crisis. And people just didn't want to lend money to Deutsche Bank, so they were driving interest rates way up. Uh, and you can't you can't always tell who your counterparty is, so it's hard to unwind these. Anyway, the Fed intervened, but it was already suspect because why does it need to intervene? You know, you know, banks have a lot of liquidity on the books, right? On the books, there's a lot of liquidity. So why is the Fed intervening? And and I think that was a first indication, not of co coronavirus, but something was going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, and that, and now we're seeing, of course, all of that on steroids, where mm -hmm. the, the, the Fed is basically committed to providing liquidity in every sector of the economy. And, and there are people arguing that the Fed should be allowed now to buy corporate bonds, stocks, stocks yeah. uh, everything to provide liquidity to every market. That would be interesting to say the least, but that would be an unmitigated disaster if they do that long-term, short-term, it will feel great. Long-term it will be unmitigated disaster. But so far they, they just started buying um, municipal bonds. That's the latest that they're buying. So they're buying now treasuries, US bonds, in other words, government bonds, they're buying uh, mortgage-backed securities and they're buying more, uh, munis, municipality. And notice what that does, that lowers the cost of buying for city governments 
who probably can't afford to run their programs. And the Fed, basically, we're doing a massive bailout implicitly of all these cities and counties that didn't plan for, for something like this. Yeah, I mean, I think the muni bond market crashed by the most since 1981 is the uh, headline I saw. Um, but on top of that, a few programs you left out, Iran, yep. uh, money market funds. They yep. announced a program to support money market funds. Um, and then also commercial paper to buy commercial paper to support. So that's short term. Paper is. What's that? Tell us what commercial paper is. Oh, yeah. Commercial paper is basically short term loans to corporations. So it can be from 30 to 90 days, typically. Um, and so corporations would issue this to get short term loans to, you know, pay for inventory that they're going to sell within 30 to 90 days, maybe, uh, you know, meet bills that are, are you know, coming due sooner than they get the, re the revenues for them and so on. Um, but, you know, here's one thing, though, is when you have ultra low short term interest rates and longer term rates are higher. So if, if short term rates are zero and long term rates are three or four percent, you know, maybe a lot of corporations are going to issue short term paper to build a factory or do some kind of long term investment because, you can save yourself a lot of money that way. So as a result, they get in this illiquid position where all of a sudden they can't borrow the money they need anymore. They, you want to keep rolling over these short-term commercial paper loans to fund their long-term investments. All of a sudden they can't, they don't have the money to pay them back. The market starts to collapse and then the Fed to the rescue. Okay, so one of the parallels then with 2008, so 2008, it was the Fed started doing things that, um, People never imagined that the Fed would do. And so you're saying now in this one, they're doing even more new things that they've never done before uh, in, in the face of this. Uh, yeah. One of the important differences is in 2008, some people objected. There were voices to say, wait, wait a minute. These are new, th you know, you don't know. Nobody's objecting now. There's yeah. no voices out there saying, no, they should sit it out. They should, or they should do something different. Everybody basically is on this train of the only hope we have is that the Fed does more liquidity. More, do more, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so we, again, dulled our senses. There's a real sense, and this is, I guess, a, 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 an epistemological point. I mean, there's a real sense in which it, our scope of thinking keeps shrinking every crisis, and people become more complacent, more tuned with intervention in the mixed economy and authoritarianism. It's the point you made about Trump's election. It's it, 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 it just... It just constantly reinforces this this dulling of the brain of dulling of the mind well, i mean i think one sense dulling of the mind is that nothing bad has happened so far so you know back in 2008 people were complaining because it's okay you're doing these radical monetary uh actions and policies which you'll know, seem pretty extreme and have to have bad consequences but 10 12 years later there's we still have not seen the bad consequences or at least they've been under the surface and they're starting to come to light now uh, but everybody thinks, oh, it did great. It saved us in 2008. It caused the economy to recover. And we had an amazing economy and stock market for the last 10 years. So it worked. Now, so they don't, uh, they don't uh, connect what's happening now to the fact that that's the unwinding of all the things the Fed was doing before. So, so the, first thing the, Fed, the first thing the Fed has done is they've reactivated all the programs that they did uh, initiate in 2008. So like the money market fund was something they did in 2008. Uh, the, the quantitative easing is something that they started in 2008 and so on. Um, so, but now they are doing new stuff like the muni bond stuff is something new. Um, but I think you're right. All the voices are now pushing them to do more. So, you know, bail out muni bonds now, you know, backstop, uh, you know, treasury repos and so on. And uh, so, uh, but, you know, again, because they think it works, you know, another thing is people thought it would cause inflation. Even the Fed thought it would cause inflation, or at least it was a good chance it would. In fact, they've been trying to cause inflation for the last 10 years and failing and not sure why they're failing. Um, and here we mean so, price inflation. We mean price, price inflation. inflation. Sorry, yeah, price inflation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, people worried about that in 2008. That didn't happen for some reason, which I don't understand. And the Fed doesn't understand even. Um, so it seems like it doesn't cause any bad thing. You know, same with deficit financing. So, yeah. you know, the government can can borrow, you know, 30-year bonds got as low as 0.7% yield last week. Now they've jumped back up to 1.7% for 30 years, but I mean, that's just an astonishingly low yield for 30 years. Um, so, you know, we're already running trillion dollar deficits. Uh, U.S. budget deficit was already a trillion dollars going into this. Um, and now... You know they're going to be doing. I think I think the headline a couple hours ago said the stimulus package is now up to two trillion. The Congress is voting on. Well, um, the, the British did the equivalent of three trillion, and the da the Dutch in Denmark they've just done two and a, or the equivalent in the U.S. What would be two and a half trillion? Okay, yeah. 
It's incredible. The equivalent uh, is a G- size of GDP. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So they think they can borrow as much as they want and yields don't go up and inflation isn't going up and so on. So they think they can do all these things and there will be no bad consequences and they think it will help. So, I mean, that's the kind of dulling of the senses. So it will cause bad things down the road, but nobody understands that or connects with that. So, and, and it already has, right? So, so yeah. while there was no inflation and there were no crashes and the economy seemed to be doing okay, the economy only did okay, right? Yeah. So um, from 2009 on, the economy has grown, including under the greatest economy in all of human history, Trump, it only grew at around 2%, which is pathetic, truly pathetic in terms of economic growth. I think I, I saw this statistics once. If the United States had grown between, I don't know, 1890 and, and 1980, one percentage less per year during that period, we today would be poorer than Mexico. Okay. So one percentage compounded is huge. So the fact that we only grew at 2% versus 3% historical growth or 4% or 5% potential growth. Who knows, maybe it's 6 or 7%. I don't know what the upside potential is of a truly free market. That is the real cost, you know, even without this crisis. The cost is the fact that there was no growth and then that there was probably more growth in areas where we didn't really need it. Right. And no growth, maybe, for example, in hospital beds, in areas where we did need it. Because, you know, I don't know if we, one of the reasons we don't have hospital beds is because of regulation and because of cost cutting dictated by Medicare and Medicaid. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe private hospitals, like pretty bet, would have more beds. So all of that is unseen. This goes back to economics in one lesson by Hazlitt. It's the unseen that is important in economics. And yet nobody wants to see the unseen. Nobody yeah. makes the effort. Yeah. And I mean, just, I don't know if this gets too far away from where you want to go, Ankar, but uh, just to throw this on the pile too, in terms of consequences, the last 10 years, it's been brutal for anybody on a fixed income. Yep. So mm-hmm. with 0% interest rates, and you can't afford to take a lot of risk because you're 80 years old. So you can't put all your money in the stock market and you know, hope that it's higher 20 years from now. Um, you need a fixed income that you can count on that's low risk, but you can't get that because interest rates are so low. Um, so that's been brutal for people trying to live on a fixed income and not take undue risks. Um, it's been hard for people who are saving for retirement if you can't get decent yields on bonds. So they have to put all their money in the stock market instead and hope for the best. Now that's crashing and who knows where that's going to go to. Right on the point where the baby boomers are reaching peak retirement age. Um, and then, you know, pension funds and insurance funds have been suffering for the last 10 years because they build in a certain assumption about what kind of yield they're going to get on bonds, which has not been anywhere close to being realized. So insurance funds are you know, finding their portfolios are in rough shape. Pension funds are way underfunded. Um, and now they're going to be even more underfunded with the stock market 30% lower. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it, you know, one, one thing that I saw about a year or two ago, the uh, Illinois, which is one of the worst in terms of pension, pension underfunding, the public pension, uh, the treasurer issued something like $10 billion of bonds municipal bonds so that she could take that money and put it into the pension fund to put it in stocks because she could issue bonds at a few percent and then stocks you know, would make 10 or 20% a year. Um, so that was her plan for you know, you're getting the pension fund back on a sound footing. And I thought, okay, that's going to be a disaster, of course. And here we are. So now it's going to be, you know, the Illinois pension fund is going to be even worse off than it was. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. And to reinforce what you just said, it's not just the Illinois pension fund. I'm sure a lot of 80 year olds seeing yields and bonds so low, seeing what was happening in the stock market, shifted their portfolios yeah. into stocks. Absolutely. I know, I know, I know that uh, pension plans, insurance companies, endowments, all the, went way more into stocks than they should have Yeah. because there was no yield. That, so this is called yield chasing. And you see that in financial markets all the time. People are willing to buy ridiculous stuff just to get a little bit more yield and, and take on huge risk. And of course, the consequence of that is what we're experiencing right now. A lot of these people are gonna be wiped out. And many of these pension plans and insurance companies were already underfunded before this. Now are gonna be hopelessly underfunded. Um, and uh, you know, who knows where that, where that leaves us uh, in the short run and in the long run. Yeah, oh, and so- especially with the largest segment of the United States population hitting retirement age right now, so. So what we've been talking about or what you guys have been talking about is the the financial either dislocations or misallocations going on as a result of um, government or Fed policy. And 
but also that in this crisis that the willingness to yeah let's let the fed do whatever they want so that's on more on the financial side now if we put it on the more the sort of production trade um an exchange of goods and so on, not just financial services the financial markets obviously there's a similar thing going on now that government can but here it's not it's shutting down massive amounts of things and so obviously individual people are struggling if your restaurant um is either shut down or all you can do is take out and so, so it's a it's a ma- at an individual level and it's not distributed equally there's right. massive dislocation but now thinking of it as sort of a little more economy wide both short term given all the i mean we live in a global environment incredible division of labor and specialization and if some parts start shutting down or can't or not allowed to function it's not like it's just okay that's n- no longer going on it has all kinds of ramifications for the whole economy and production so mm-hmm. both thinking short term but also thinking longer term and people are asking so we've been talking about some of sort of of what has happened of what are possible scenarios of what might happen or continue to happen given what's being done and you can't get any kind of clarity i mean cuz i think just as the fed you were talking about that they don't know what they're doing it's not clear any of these these government officials have any idea what they're doing when would they lift like when would people get back to production so so both so there's incredible uncertainty but also incredible halt in productive activities and how both are you guys thinking about that but how do you think the market's reacting to that too yeah i mean i i think it's just incredible and i'm still trying to wrap my head around it so you know some of the numbers that you see um next week's unemployment number is supposed to be 3 million new unemployed is was one estimate um at the peak of the t- or the nadir of the 2008 crisis i think it was 800,000 new unemployed in a week so i mean this is just off the charts um there's layoffs that have happened and are coming so i've seen numbers as high as 6 million or even 9 million people laid off for the duration of how long we're shut down and that you mean us us this yeah. is just us yeah just- yeah um yeah. Goldman Sachs, their forecast for second quarter GDP, gross domestic product, so the production, they're forecasting minus 24% in GDP, um, which, I mean, that's depression levels. Like, that's that's not recession. That's just instant stoppage depression. depression. Absolutely. So, you know, what are the consequences? The big issue is that the cash flows have been frozen. So, you know, to some extent, you still have to pay. You have to pay your bills. You have to pay your mortgage. You have to pay interest on your loans. Um, whatever other fixed commitments you have, but you don't have the revenue coming in. So if you're an individual, you may not have a salary or wages coming in. If you're a company, if you're a restaurant or retail store, you don't have the sales revenue coming in. So, you know, I fear for retail stores and small business. They typically operate on very thin margins. They don't have a lot of cash cushion. Um, If we stay shut for two months, I don't think a lot of restaurants are going to reopen. I think a lot of retail stores are just going to be gone out of business. Um, So, you know, even two weeks, they're going to be in tough shape. So how, you know, how bad it is based on how long we stay shut, I don't know. I don't think government people know either. So you know, in some sense, it's been kind of cavalier, just the ham-fisted way they've said shut down everything. Um, so yeah, there was another point I was going to make as well. Um, oh yeah, so the cash flow issue. You know, and so the, I mean, there's the, the policymakers are aware of that to some extent. So this is why they're coming up with their programs to send a thousand dollar check to every adult and to, um, I think one program was to give money to companies to allow them to pay sick leave for two weeks. Um, so they're trying to adapt for that, but you know, what does that do exactly? And how, how, well, first of all, how soon is the money going to go out? So like, you know, some people are saying you know, Mnuchin, I think said he wants the money to go out in one to two weeks. Whereas the back office people, you know, the actual bureaucrats as well, it's going to take us like two to three months to get the money out there to people. So is that really going to have any effect? Should it have an effect? Should they even be doing that? Um, that's a good question too. I don't know. So in, in one sense, it's their fault for shutting everything down and putting people in this cash crunch. On another hand, you know, this is going to be a huge boondoggle. So they send thousand dollar check to every adult. They give, you know, money, free money to companies to you know, pay the sick leave and so on. You know, what kind of graft and what kind of, you know, it's just going to be a huge mess just to how that all that sorts out. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I think that's all, that's, that's right. And I, I think the pain here is really going to be felt by the small business, small businesses. Yeah. I, mean, I think about people who put 
their whole life savings into a business, who put blood, sweat, and tears into a business that, that work day in, day out. I mean, a lot of people out there have run small businesses and been small business owners, and they know the kind of effort, and, and, and they, they have everything in it. And the margins are small. Take a restaurant, tiny margins. Mm -hmm. Even though they might be super restaurant, they might be phenomenal, and customers love them, and they're working long hours, and, and suddenly they have no income, not because of anything they did. Yeah. And I mean, I think about the restaurants, you know, people know I, I love to eat out and I know a lot of the restaurateurs here in, in San Juan. And these are, these are people who are who put all their life into this. This is the passion, but it's also everything they own. And I can't, I mean, you know, I would, I'd be willing to go eat at their restaurants just to, just to support them right now. Yeah. And I'm not allowed to, and I'm not allowed to. And some of them are trying to do takeout. And I, I told my wife, Let's just order takeout stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. really, because I yeah, love to order. In a sense, incredible value to me. I want them to be around when they, when, if, when we come out of this. And, but they can't, not all of them can even do that because it takes a lot of money and a lot of resources to facilitate takeout, which, which, and there's not a lot of demand for it, unfortunately, because most people are just staying home and cooking. Um, so it's, it's, it really is tragic. And this is the thing. It's so easy to lose the real pain and suffering in the aggregate numbers. Yeah. GDP goes down by 20%. That sounds awful. Mm -hmm. What's really awful, I mean, what, what maybe makes it awful is the millions and millions and millions of people who are out of work, the millions and millions of people who are going to lose their businesses, the millions and millions of people who are now going to really struggle or just now become dependent on the government, which psychologically and in every other sense is somewhat even worse than going bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it's, it's just... The, the pain and suffering this is going to cause a lot of people. Now, a lot of us, luckily, are in a position, hopefully, where we're going to weather this storm, but millions and millions and millions of people are not. Yeah, yeah. so we yeah. have four minutes left. Oh, really? What? What? Yeah, I think we're going to an hour. I think so. Um, <laughs> wow. We could go longer. It's okay with me. Happy to go longer. I agree. Because I think there's still stuff we should say about at least what we think was going to happen. Yeah, well, that's what that's what was saying. You would have to say that in, in three minutes. I might be a little less pessimistic than Rob in the short run. <laughs> more pessimistic in the long run, if that's possible. <laughs> yeah, I'm being told we said we keep it to an hour, so maybe we can do it. This is bonus bonus, <laughs> bonus time. You can tune out now if you want. Um, yeah, so how how are you thinking of this in terms of so it's obviously a short-term um, impact, but is it? Will it have longer-term um, consequences? So, I think it. I mean, part of what you've been talking about in terms of in the financial realm and giving the Fed these kinds of powers and so on. It's very rare for government agencies to then say, "Oh yeah, we'll give these powers back. We'll never use these again." And so, so in that sense, it, it expands the powers of federal agencies and the, and and um, in the, in, and their power over financial markets. In the economy, I mean, it it sets a precedent that the government can say we're going to shut down things. Yeah. Um, and it's highly. I mean, I we've talked about this in another webinar. We will likely keep talking about this kind of issue on what basis they're shutting it down is highly, highly questionable. But, but it's still, I find it surprising too in America, how much people are willing to say, yeah, everything can shut down. And I mean, there are some voices saying, is, and we need stimulus and so on, but the, I mean, grinding production to a halt, should one think of that as just, it's a short term and it hurts, and it hurts a lot more than people think, but that longer term, it doesn't have that much consequence? I mean, I'll say what I think, and then Rob. Um, I mean, I think it has long-term consequences because it's very hard to restart production. Yeah. And you lose the price signal. You lose. You lose information. You say so shut down in a week. So what should I produce now? What do people actually want? Mm -hmm. Continue. I mean, and and again, it's hard to completely conceptualize because of the complexity of the price signal and the supply chains and everything else. But it's it's very very. It's really hard to ramp up again, to hire people again if you've laid them off. This is why, for example, in Denmark and UK, they're paying people. The government is paying because their excuses, if, 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 they, if they fire them and then hire them, then that's too disruptive. So we'll just keep them on payroll and we'll pay you for it. Now, I think that has other problems, but there's a certain sense in which that makes sense in a 
status bizarre world that we live in, right? So I, I, think, I think it takes a while for production to ramp up. They don't know what to produce. There'll be malproduction. They'll produce the wrong things at the wrong times. You'll see, you'll see too much toilet paper in the supermarket suddenly because the last thing they remember is huge demand for toilet paper, and that's gone already, or things like that. Um, that's one. Uh, but, and I think, I think what's, you know, my view is what's going to happen in the short run is... <laughs> All this government intervention is going to, quote, work in a sense, right? So, yeah, the Fed is going to provide liquidity, which is going to ease certain pressures in the marketplace. It's going to create other pressures, but it's going to ease the short-term pressures. The government writing everybody a check for $1,000 is actually going to allow people to pay bills and do a few things, and it's going to, quote, work in the short run, and it's going to prevent people from really going out. And how they do that, I doubt, I, I've got a bet with a friend of mine. I said, no checks are going out ever. <laughs> It, it, it's too, it's actually, if I, you know, if, if I were a mixed economist running the thing, the, the, the one stimulus that actually makes sense, if you're going to do this, then just write checks to people. Because then at least people get to use their values to determine how it's going to spend rather than politicians doing the graft thing of just, oh, we're going to bail out Boeing. Why not? It has nothing to do with coronavirus, the fact that they're bankrupt, but we're going to bail them out anyway, because that was our opportunity because we want the Washington voters or whatever. Uh, so, I, you know, I think a lot of this stuff will actually have some short-term consequences. And I think this will be a steep decline and I think we'll start rising, but the rise. So if in 2008, after 2009, everybody complained about everything was so slow in recovering. Now it's going to be even slower in recovery. Mm -hmm. And if growth after 2009 was 2%, now we'll be lucky if it's 1%. So my view is, we might, the world might not end in this crisis. We might be building again an edifice for a much bigger one, <laughs> right? Because, and it might be, this is the way we, we decline. This is the way we fail is through a series of these crises. Mm -hmm. But the consequence of slow economic growth, maybe negative economic growth for a few years, maybe zero economic growth for a few years, but it's going to be prolonged. And, and to go to a point you made on call, it has expanded government power dramatically power that will never come back to the people. Um, I, I think it's much more likely we get socialized medicine now. I think it's much more likely we get socialization of a lot of other functions. And we know where that leads. That leads ultimately to authoritarianism and oppression and, 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 and economic, complete economic collapse. And I think ultimately that's where we're heading. I'm just not sure it's gonna happen in the next six months. Yeah, I think I largely agree with what Yaron is saying. Um, you know, the economy is not something you could just turn the switch off and then flip it back on. Um, you know, maybe after a week, things could you know, not be too, too bad. But if this goes two weeks, three weeks, a month, and who knows how long it's going to go. Um, there's, there's just tremendous damage going on under the surface. Um, and so it's, it's not just an aggregate thing that, you know, either it's working or it's not working. It's just all kinds of micro relationships, uh, all kinds of you know, just the cash flow issue. So you never know who's going to be stuck with not enough cash to pay their bills or, um, and, you know, so once things do come back, for one, people are going to be a lot more risk averse, which they should be. Part of the problem is that the Fed has caused people to be uh, less risk averse than they should be and taking bigger risks than they should be and being more levered than they should be. Uh, but that, as Yaron says, that's going to mean growth is going to be a lot slower to return. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I mean, it's just there's just tremendous, tremendous destruction going on. I, I'm really still trying to figure out exactly where that all ends up um, in terms of the government powers. So yeah, so we see with the Fed, um, you know, stuff that was controversial and that they were scrambling to do in 2008 is now just oh yeah, no problem, just turn it back on now. We'll start doing those programs plus a bunch of new stuff. So now those will be part of their arsenal. Um, you know, in some extent, it is the Fed's job to provide liquidity to the market. That's what they've said their job is. That's what they said they will, they will do. Um, you know, so in some sense, you can't say the Fed is a lender of last resort, and that's their function. And then, you know, all of a sudden today, say, oh, actually, no, we're not going to, you know, let it all crash. So to some extent, because they've said that, that they need to make good on their promise and be the lender of last resort now. Um, but then they should unwind that. They should, we should get rid of that function so that people don't rely on it and come to think, okay, you know, the Fed will ride to the rescue because they will provide liquidity, they'll bail us out, they'll, you know, do repos so that uh, they'll be... You know, our positions in the market won't crash and so on. Um, so, the, so, you know, it's the Fed that keeps causing these problems and then they rise, they have to ride to the rescue to 
um, deal with the aftermath of these problems. So if the Fed weren't standing there saying we're going to bail you out, then people wouldn't take so much risk that they needed to be bailed out. So, you know, Jim Grant has this great comment. He says, you know, the Fed gets credit for being the fireman, but they never get the blame for being the arsonist in the first place. So. Can I make one comment? I just want to make one comment about trade. One of the things that's going to save us is trade with China. The fact is that China's ramping up right now production. When we are shutting down production, so whatever goods we are going to be able to consume in the months forward, we're going to be more reliant than ever on China. And, and by the way, Mexico, Mexico, there's no, they haven't shut down the Mexican economy. So the extent that Mexico is producing and people are going to work and creating stuff. I mean, I think, I, I mean, put aside Trump, but I think most people underestimate the huge benefit international trade globalization has provided the United States. I think much of our economic growth over the last 30 years, and maybe one of the reasons we didn't have inflation, has to do with it, dramatic, unprecedented increases in productivity on a global scale, while productivity in the United States was, was, was moderate productivity increases. Globally, they increased dramatically. And I think that, you know, the insanity right now of having a president who thinks trade is a bad thing and an economic advisor, a, a, a pseudo economic advisor, I'm sorry, uh, by the name of Pino Navarro, who is actually drafting legislation right now or, or executive orders to try to restrict trade with China during this crisis even further, to use it as an opportunity to bring back production to the United States is so sickening because I actually think, while the Chinese are at fault to, to some extent about what's happened because they, they, they didn't release information early on and they try to suppress it, they are also, they could be not our saviors, but they could help mitigate a lot of the costs that are gonna happen because they are still producing. The fact that these guys are in charge is so sickening and so scary. Um, and and uh, we should, you know, we should, as soon as this crisis had started, lower tariffs, I mean, we should lower tariffs to zero anyway, but as, a, as an emergency measure even, lower tariffs to zero and say, yeah, we're not going to be able to produce for a while, so please, other parts of the world produce so that we can, we still have stuff. And instead, the mentality is the opposite. The mentality is build walls, close borders, don't allow trade, you know, lock ourselves in. And it, it, it really is the, what scares me more than anything are the, are the, the people running the asylum. Uh, from Powell, who's a nothing and a nobody running the Federal Reserve. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing because the guys who had PhDs were even worse. Um, to our political leaders who are worse than nothing. Um, and anyway, I, I, I want to give a big plug for international trade because I, I, you know, it's crucial in this context. Um, so maybe let's end with this general point. So if not a science fiction um, optimistic scenario, but something that would be realistic if people thought about it and tried to learn some lessons given their context of knowledge, which is very mixed and as it's, I mean, from we think from a philosophical perspective has all kinds of errors and wrong uh, views, but still, so I mean, one thing I think some people could learn is yeah, international trade is more important than we thought it is. And are there other things that you think people could learn from a positive perspective from this crisis? Now, I think mostly crises are um, there. Things go worse after a crisis, not better. But you can find places that um, uh, I mean, if you take, say, Japan after World War Two, it's they learned some things, I think, actually learned some things about what was wrong, about what they did before. So to, to, to try to paint uh, optimistic, but not fantasy thing, what, what would you say that it, if things go the best sort of, that they can go given the context, what might happen? So, and one is people could learn to appreciate international trade and the whole phenomenon of globalization, uh, that it's been an enormous boon to life, not we need to shut it down. You know, I, I, I fear that people are learning exactly the opposite. So because I, I see on my feeds and everywhere, I see people saying, this proves now that we need to manufacture masks and ventilators. And, you know, now the list of emergency equipment in the United States so that we're not dependent on the Chinese or whatever. So I, I fear people have, have learned the opposite. But I think, 
you know, maybe, and again, I think this is being overly optimistic because I think I agree with you. Crises are oh, people, people always, uh, we come out of crises less free than we enter them. I, I can't think in American history, um, with the exception of the 70s, with the exception of the 70s, because I think, I think because of Ayn Rand and, and people like Milton Friedman, I think, I think they changed the intellectual climate. And there's nobody like that today. There's not, there's no intellectual voice out there that is even a little bit, you know, in that direction. There's no, to be optimistic. <laughs> that's it. There's nobody. Um, so, I, you know, maybe as things ramp up and people suddenly discover that one of the big constraints on ramping back up are regulations, employment and regulations. So for example, if you fired people in California, now you have to hire them. <laughs> Good luck, right? Um, and maybe people start saying, well, or, or the licensing laws for doctors, you know, they've lo loosened them up a little bit and they're allowing across state license, you know, recognition and allowing retired doctors to come back and things like that. Maybe people start realizing that some of the employment regulations a massive burden to recovering from crises like this. And maybe we should loosen some of that up. But, but I, I still think that's being a little overly optimistic about things. Yeah, that would probably be the one thing I would point to too is potentially optimistic. So there's stories out there like there was a, uh, a scientist in Washington that was running some kind of uh, clinical study on, uh, I forget what it was, but she wanted to, she was seeing these cases of the coronavirus showing up and she wanted to shift her study, her research to that. But, you know, she didn't have FDA approval or she didn't, you know, whatever. She was asking for approval to, you know, I want to study this instead. So finally she just started doing it, you know, illegally in a sense. Um, and so that gave us a good leg up that she was starting to provide information and so on. So, you know, the more stories like that get out, you can hope that people would say, okay, these regulations are really stifling us from doing the right thing and being allowed to do the right thing. Um, optimistically, uh, I hope, but you know, as Ron says, I doubt that <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Um, in terms of the Fed, I had been somewhat hopeful because in the few years going up to this, I was starting to see more and more people blaming the Fed. So in terms of Wall Street economists, yep. now, academic economists are pretty clueless. They really don't understand how the markets work, how the economy works in terms of nitty gritty. Wall Street economists are quite good. Like they, they tend to see the details, the microstructure, what the effects are, where distortions are showing up and that kind of thing. Academic economists just look at the aggregates, aggregate spending, aggregate uh, demand, aggregate investment and so on. Um, so I was seeing more and more Wall Street economists questioning what the Fed was doing and that that would lead to problems that would unwind. But I mean, the problem is I was, I was hoping that the crash would come naturally from you know, the economic distortions hitting a wall and finally having to unravel. And then people would blame the Fed, or at least a lot of people would. Uh -huh. but instead, you know, the coronavirus comes along and pricks the bubble. So now everybody says, oh, yeah, it was a coronavirus. So, you know, you could never have predicted that. That's just completely out of the blue. And that's what's causing the uh, economic downturn not the Fed, not their zero interest rate policies, not the huge over leveraged position the economy was in and so on. So, so that, that uh, optimistic hope, I guess, is out the window now. I, I do want to warn people about the economists that are out there, the investment advisors that are out there that are fear mongering right now about, I mean, stuff is really bad, but that uh, basically with conviction and certainty, saying dollar is going to collapse, mm. uh, the world is going to end. And the same people who did exactly the same thing in 2008. Because, um, I, I, you know, and, and it's, it's, you know, just try to think for yourself, try to get information from a number of different sources. D don't just rely on, on a podcast that says the end of the world is here. It might be. There's a probability that that actually does happen. But it's nobody knows. Nobody knows, including us, with certainty how this is going to play out. Yeah. Anybody who claims certainty in this crisis, don't listen to them. <laughs> you know, yeah. that should be the criteria, epistemological criteria for who you should listen to. Certainty is not an option because it, 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 as we said in the beginning, it, it's way too complex, way too many moving parts, way too many decisions being made along the different decision trees to be able to predict exactly what, how this is going to play out. And for those of you thinking the dollar is going to go to hell, it might, but if it does, so will the euro, and so will the yen, and so will the yuan. And it's not like there's some safe haven to go to other than gold. You know, there's not like there's other currencies that are better. It's it's the European Central Bank is just as bad as the Fed or worse. worse. The Chinese Central Bank has been worse than the Fed for decades. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do think we'll come out of this. I do think we'll come out of this worse. I do think, by the way, 
to, to, to end kind of optimistically, it is an opportunity for us, all of us, to advocate for the right ideas. This is an opportunity to say, told you so, look at how government screws things up, look at the testing, look at the things that the government did badly, um, look at how important production is. People think consumption is everything. Well, let's test this. <laughs> let's, let's stop production for a little while and see what happens, right? And, and it's an opportunity for the more rational voices to be heard, to speak up. And maybe at some point, I think people will start listening. I'm not convinced it's now, but at some point, it'll be death or listen. There won't be any other alternatives. There won't be a middle ground. So we need to ramp up our voice exactly in times of crisis like this. Okay, well, I think that is a good and encouraging point to end on. So we got, we got 15 minutes of bonus time here. And I wanna thank Yaron and Rob for making the time. And unfortunately, I think we're gonna to have to talk about some of these issues in the next few weeks because I don't think things are gonna be lifted. Um, and we'll be talking about other, on, on uh, philosophy for living on earth, we'll be talking about other aspects of the, the pandemic and the crisis as well. But thanks, I mean, this is certainly one big angle that is important to think about in regard to what is going on. So thanks a lot and uh, have a great day. Good. Bye everyone, thanks for joining us. Good day everybody, bye.